The title of our sermon this morning is, And You He Made Alive. And You He Made Alive. Our primary text, John chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. And welcome back, folks, to our study of the essentials. One sermon, one hour, one theological subject, an introduction essential to the growth and maturity of the Christian. And in this study of the essentials, it's been our joy, a blessing, it's been a privilege over many weeks now to consider our confession of faith, systematic theology, and doctrines that are essential to the growth of the Christian, uh, the doctrine of revelation, the doctrine of God, the doctrine of man, the doctrine of sin. It's been a blessing to consider our redemption accomplished by the person and work of our great Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we've come to a section in our study where we consider um, our redemption applied by the Spirit of God. And particular to our concern this morning is the work of the Spirit of God in regeneration. In regeneration. Now, as we learned last Lord's Day, the application of our redemption by the Spirit of God begins with an effectual call. The London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 10, regarding the effectual call, says this, Those whom God hath predestinated, predestinated unto life he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time effectually to call to himself. Now, this call is by his word and spirit. It's a call out of the state of sin and death in which they are by nature to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ. It's a call out of sin and death, a call to grace and salvation by the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that word effectual, it's an effectual call. That word effectual is used to distinguish this particular call of God from that general or universal call of the gospel that is so often ineffectual due to man's sin and rebellion. There's an effectual call and there's an external, universal, or general call that's often ineffectual and ineffectual entirely due man's sin. While many dead in their sin do not respond in saving faith to the gospel call and they perish eternally in hell, those whom God effectually calls to himself do turn from sin. They do turn to saving faith in Christ and they are given by the Lord everlasting life. Now what makes the effectual call effectual? What makes it effectual? Why does the sinner respond? In other words, the question we're asking is, what does that call consist of? What does the effectual call consist of? Well, our confession goes on to explain in chapter 10 that the effectual call consists of God by his Holy Spirit, listen, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving to them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills, and by his almighty power, determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet so as they come most freely, they're not dragged against their will, right? They come most freely being made willing by his grace. That's why the call is called effectual. That's why it's described as efficacious. This is the effectual call, sometimes referred to as irresistible grace or efficacious grace, in that it most certainly will accomplish the intended result. Why does it accomplish the intended result? It's because it's a work of divine power. It accomplishes the intended result because it is a work of divine power alone. It is monergistic, does not depend upon man, depends upon the work of God alone by his spirit. You can't do anything to contribute to this work, do you see? It is initiated by God and only initiated by God. God doesn't work this effectual call in response to man. God initiates the call. God in divine power effectuates the call. God in divine power carries it out. Whenever the Bible mentions the effectual nature of this grace, it's ascribed to an active work of God. He made us alive. He gave us a new heart right? He made us a new creation. Of his own will, he brought us forth. Whenever the Bible mentions this effectual grace of God with respect to us, 
It always mentions that in the context of us being passive. Now think about this with me. He made us alive. He gave us a new heart. He made us a new creation. Of his own will, he brought us forth. And we are called passive. We are made alive. We are created anew in Christ Jesus. We are born again. We are saved. Passive. No cooperation is what that means. It's not synergistic. It's monergistic. John Owen said that this grace of God is infallible, victorious, irresistible, or always effective, always efficacious. It removes all obstacles, it overcomes all oppositions, and infallibly infallibly produces the effect intended. It can't not produce the effect intended when God in power is behind the work. Do you see? The grace is effectual, the grace is irresistible, not because it drags a man to Christ against his will, but because it changes men's hearts so that they respond freely, so that they come most freely, being made willing, our confession says, by his grace. Made willing, passive. Do you see? Now, for that call to be effectual as opposed to ineffectual, presupposes that the call is answered. Think with me. If the call is effectual, it brings about the intended or desired result. That means the call presupposes an answer. If the call of God is effectual, then the call itself will bring about the intended response in the one whom God calls. John Murray said, it is God who calls, but it is not God who answers the call. The sinner is the one who answers the call, isn't he? The sinner who is called must answer. And what we're talking about here in this answer involves a saving response to the gospel. It involves a saving response. A response that involves the heart of the sinner. A response that involves the mind of the sinner. A heart, a response that involves the will of the sinner. The actions of the sinner. And despite an absurd number of churches that teach otherwise... Coming to Christ on the part of a sinner does not involve merely a physical or volitional act. A physical, volitional, or even a mental act. It does not mean that walking an aisle, praying a prayer to receive him, asking Jesus into your heart, getting baptized, taking the Lord's Supper, going to Mass, whatever it is is that you do, doesn't mean that any of that is effectual. A mere act of man's will or a mere decision on man's part A mere decision of man's mind is not what makes the call effective or effectual. John Bunyan said that many came to Christ in his day carnally or bodily that had no saving advantage. In other words, in a service, when the invitation was given, they made a decision of their heart and mind to grit their teeth and get down the aisle at the altar call and give their heart to Jesus. They made a decision. And they followed up with some action that supposedly gives credence to that decision. Why confuse any of this with any kind of physical action? Why confuse it? Why would you add any kind of physicality to this that is a spiritual call and a spiritual response on the part of the sinner? It's deceptive to do that. John Bunyan, even in his day, 500 years ago, would say so. No, no. We are called by the gospel to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. The call calls us to repentance and faith. Now think with me for a moment. What is wrought in the heart of man by the Spirit of God in genuine repentance and saving faith? Think with me. This is not a a mere decision. This is not an act of man's will. Think with me what those terms encompass. Repentance and faith in the sinner's response to the gospel. Repentance involves the sinner's apprehension of his own wretched condition. Did you hear me? Repentance involves an apprehension of your own wretched condition outside of the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, outside of the grace of God. Sinners think to themselves, I have need of nothing. And what does the Lord Jesus Christ say? You do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's the problem with our condition outside of the grace of God is that we don't think we need anything. We're not that bad. God's not that mad, right? 
Repentance involves a godly or a Godward sorrow over sin. A sorrow over sin because it's a sin against the holy God. The Puritan William Perkins said, Godly sorrow causes grief for sin because it is sin. <laughs> it makes any man in whom it is to be of this disposition in mind. That if there were no conscience to accuse, no devil to terrify, no judge to arraign and condemn, no hell to torment, yet he would be humbled and brought to his knees for his sins because he hath offended a loving, merciful, and long-suffering God. It's a sorrow against our God who created us. Repentance involves confession of sin. Thomas Watson, it's a sorrow that vents itself at the eyes by weeping and vents itself at the tongue with confession. Repentance involves shame for sin. Right, The prodigal cries out to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy anymore to be called your son. It's a shame over sin. Repentance involves a hatred for our sin. God himself says, encompassed in the new covenant, that you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for what? For your iniquity. Repentance involves a turning from sin, a turning in your heart, your mind, your will, your actions. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. That's repentance. The one who comes to Jesus Christ must come in repentance. The one who turns in repentance must turn in faith and trust to the Lord Jesus Christ. Think with me about faith. Faith abandons all self-merit. Faith abandons all self-righteousness. And faith draws us to the Lord Jesus Christ for his merit and by his merit alone. One said, Faith flees with all the soul's poverty to Christ's riches. It moves with the soul's guilt to Christ as reconciler and with the soul's bondage to Christ as liberator. Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Save me, Jesus, or I die. Faith lays hold of Christ. Faith clings to his word. Faith trusts in his promises. Faith follows him as Lord. Joel Beakey said that faith rests in the person of Christ by coming, hearing, seeing, trusting, taking, embracing, knowing, rejoicing, loving, and triumphing in him. It's impossible for man, isn't it, in his natural state? Think about that response with me for a second. Repentance and faith. We're called by God to respond to the gospel in repentance and faith. And look at all that that entails. Is anyone going to sit here today and tell me that this involves a work out of man's own heart, by man's own doing, out of man's own volition, produced by man's mind, man's heart? No. <laughs> no. This is impossible. Impossible in man's natural state, it is impossible for man to gin that up out of his own heart and nature. We require a renovation of our nature. We require an entire change of who we are. We need to be made a new creation. Far from being a simple act of man's will or a decision of man's mind, to come to Christ in genuine repentance and saving faith involves a complete renovation of man. A renovation of all that man is. It requires a new heart. The call of God. The call of God is effectual. It's effective because it produces this renovation. Do you see? It produces this renovation. This is where a biblical understanding of man's depravity is so important. We must understand our depravity. Man in his sin is utterly and entirely incapable of such a response. And the Bible affirms that too. It's multiple places in Scripture. Just a reading of your Bible, that's affirmed. Man cannot. No one can come to me, Jesus says, unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Jeremiah asks, Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Or the leopard its spots? If so then may you also do good who are accustomed to do evil. You can't do good 
who are accustomed to do evil. No more than the Ethiopian can change his skin or the leopard his spots. We must be radically changed. Paul describes it this way. Follow along with me now. Paul describes it this way in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Listen. And you, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you, he made alive. God made alive you who were dead in trespasses and sins. The Bible describes this as dead. You he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. By nature. Dead. But God, verse 4, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of a works, lest anyone should boast. Now Murray follows that up with a question. The question then that we are compelled by the testimony of Scripture to ask is this. How can a person who is dead in trespasses and sins, whose mind is enmity against God, and who cannot do that which is well-pleasing in God's sight, how can that person answer a call to fellowship with Christ? How can a person whose heart is depraved How can a person whose carnal mind is enmity against God embrace him who is the supreme manifestation of the glory of a holy God? The believing, loving, repenting response which the call of God requires is a moral and a spiritual impossibility on the part of the one who is dead in trespasses and sins. It's a moral, a spiritual impossibility. Those that are in the flesh cannot please God. No one can come to him. It speaks of inability. No one can come to him unless it has been given to him by the Father. The answer to this dilemma lies in the effectual call and the effectual grace of God. The effectual call of God comes with, the effectual call of God is accompanied by the grace that gives spiritual life to those who are spiritually dead. It is grace whereby the one called is enabled, empowered, endowed in order to be able to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as he is offered to us in the gospel. This is the grace of regeneration. It's the grace of regeneration, a new birth. It's a new creation. It's a transformation or or renovation of all that man is. Matthew Barrett offers this definition. Regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit to unite the elect sinner to Christ by breathing new life into that dead and depraved sinner so as to raise him from spiritual death to spiritual life, removing his heart of stone and giving him a heart of flesh so that he is washed, born from above, and now able to repent and to trust in Christ as a new creation. Moreover, regeneration is the act of God alone, and it is therefore monergistic in nature, accomplished by the sovereign act of the Spirit, apart from and unconditioned upon man's will to believe. In short, man's faith does not cause regeneration, but regeneration causes man's faith. Really, really important at the end of that. Think with me. Really critical to understand the implications of that statement. Man's faith 
does not cause regeneration. Regeneration causes and leads to man's faith. There's something the theologians talk about. You'll read this if you study theology. It's called the order of salvation, the ordo salutis, where theologians have attempted to put into an order God's saving work in Christ applied by the Spirit, right? And there's an order in which many think of that. It's really problematic to think in terms of an order uh, because many of these things are imperceptible. Regeneration, the new birth, will most likely, in many or most cases, be imperceptible to you. You may not realize what's happened uh, until you're looking in the rearview mirror and you see the work of grace in your heart, right? But um, nevertheless, there's an importance to thinking of, in some cases, an order. These things happen many times simultaneously. When you walk into a room, right, and you're going to turn the light on, you walk over to the switch, you flip the switch, and it's almost as if at the very same time that you flip the switch, the light comes on, right? Light's pretty quick. So so the switch goes on, the light comes on, the room, the entire room flooded with light. But we know, don't we? We know that in order for the room to be flooded with light, that switch has to be flipped first. Electricity runs from the switch to the light bulb. The light bulb lights and illumines the room. We know, logically, that there is an order, even though in our experience of it, we may not physically be able to sense it. Does that make sense? The ordo salutis is much the same way. These things may come together. The effectual call, regeneration, the sinner turning with uh, an understanding of their condition, turning to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Some of these things being entirely imperceptible, other things being maybe radical and very perceptive, perceptible. But all of these things happening in our sense, in our experience of them, virtually simultaneously, but it's very important to understand that in order for man to do anything which pleases God, the switch has to be flipped first. Make sense? That is the effectual call of God and regeneration. God, in order for sinful, depraved, dead in sins and trespasses man to make any kind of a decision to follow Christ, God has to intervene with effectual grace in regeneration to cause that one who is spiritually dead, bring them to spiritual life so that they are enabled, empowered to put faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's why that repentance and faith are a gift of God and not a work that man does to merit salvation. Make sense? There are numerous passages in the Old Testament and the New Testament that we could look to inform our understanding of regeneration or the new birth. For our time this morning, turn with me to the Gospel of John. John speaks clearly of these things. So we'll spend some time this morning back in the Gospel of John. Look with me at John chapter 1, beginning at verse 10. Now hang in there with me. These passages will help us understand this work of God, this work of God's Spirit. And we want to understand and apply our understanding so that we can uh, walk and worship as we should. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, John makes a distinction between the children of wrath and the children of God. So we're seeing contrasted, beginning in John chapter 1, verse 10. A distinction between the children of wrath and the children of God. He begins with a description of the children of wrath, verse 10. He, Jesus Christ, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now follow along with me. The world did not know him, and his own did not receive him. He didn't come to the world as an, a- as an alien. He didn't come to the world as a stranger. The world, he came to the world that was made through him, and he came to his own people, the very people that should have welcomed him. Rather than knowing him and rather than receiving him, they willfully rejected him. Why? Because they are children of wrath. By nature, children of wrath, just like the rest. Well, what about the children of God? Look at verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. Now, all my life, growing up in church, I've heard Scripture Twisters wreck verse 12 in an attempt to justify the sinner's prayer 
or in an attempt to justify this little methodology of praying to receive Christ for salvation. It's not what verse 12 is talking about. Many continue to butcher verse 12 to assert that faith comes before regeneration. To those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he then gives the right to become children of God. Now, many, many, many will assert those two errors from verse 12. You got to keep reading. You got to keep reading. You can't divorce verse 13 from verse 12. Many a heretic would be shamed and put to silence if they would just keep reading, right? Those children of God, verse 13, were born. They were born, and that's passive, by the way. They were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, what does that mean? Being the child of God is not the result of human descent or human descendancy, heritage. It's not hereditary. It's not passed from parents to their children. Being the child of God is not the result of human action, not a result of the flesh. Being a child of God does not come through natural processes. Being a child of God comes through supernatural processes. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. You can't save yourself by your own works, is what that means. Finally, being the child of God is not the result of human decision. It doesn't come about by the will of man. Not the result of human decision. The natural man is opposed to God. They were described in verses 10 and 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he. Speaks of inability. He cannot know them because they are spiritually discerned. The child of God is not born through any of these natural or physical means. Do you see? Man is incapable of bringing about a spiritual birth. The child of God is born of God. Behind the faith of those who believe and those who receive is the regenerating work of the Spirit of God whereby they are born of Him. Easy way to think about it, that is this. We love Him. Why? Because He first loved us. All those born into this world, all those born in Adam are still born. <laughs> you are dead on arrival, dead in your trespasses and sins, dead to the things of God. You're on the table. The heart monitor is a flat line. There's no spiritual pulse. The great physician has declared you to be dead, and he's declared you to be dead in his word. Do you see? The nurse comes in, records the time of death as your physical birth in sin. Dead on arrival. You were brought forth in iniquity. Your mother conceived you in sin. You must be born again of God. This is the doctrine of regeneration. You must be born again. Some might compare regeneration to the defibrillator paddles applied to the chest that bring a jolt of electricity to the heart, restart a dead heart. Right? But that description doesn't go far enough. Why? Because it's the same old heart. It's the same old heart. In regeneration, the great physician takes out the old, dead, lifeless, offensive heart of stone and replaces it with a new, living, soft, responsive, repentant, believing heart of flesh. He's speaking spiritually here. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, referring to the new covenant. Listen, God says, I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh so that in order that they may be able to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Apart from God doing that work, we cannot walk in his statutes and keep his judgments and do them. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Moses speaks of this in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Prophesying of the new covenant, Moses says, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart. That's the spiritual counterpart, the antitype, so to speak, to physical circumcision. Physical circumcision points to 
not baptism, physical circumcision points to spiritual circumcision of the heart. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your descendants to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. One of the clearest texts in all the Bible is found in the Lord's conversation with Nicodemus from John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3, just a couple of pages to the right. John chapter 3, and look there with me at verse 1. The Lord Jesus Christ finds himself in conversation with Nicodemus, a man whom we know by the end of the gospel is genuinely converted and is serving the Lord, even goes to the Pharisees, goes to Pilate and asks for the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is talking to him beginning in verse one. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler of the Jews. Now, Consider with me for a moment from verse 1 exactly what we know about Nicodemus, this man. Think with me. It says here that Nicodemus was a man of the Pharisees. As a Pharisee, Nicodemus was highly educated. Highly educated. Jesus calls him in verse 10, the teacher of Israel. Highly educated. He would have known his Old Testament inside and out. A Pharisee of Pharisees. Secondly, Nicodemus as a Pharisee, was therefore obsessively religious. He knew his Bible, and he's obsessively religious. Think with me. He professed to believe that in the one true and living God of Israel, he did everything that he thought he was supposed to do. Under the law of God, he would have considered himself, and others would have considered himself, to be blameless. He believed in God. He was extremely moral. He knew his Old Testament. Third, Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. Nicodemus has climbed to a position of respectability. He's not only the teacher of Israel, but he's a ruler of the Jews. Now, if anyone on the planet had any reason whatsoever to think that on their own, by their own will, according to their own decision, had any right to be right with God, certainly it would have been Nicodemus. Of all the nations in the world at that time, Nicodemus was born in Israel. Of all the Israelites in the world, he was highly educated in the scriptures. Of all those highly educated in the scriptures, he was in full-time ministry. He was a Pharisee. Today he'd be a pastor, you could say. Of all those Pharisees, he was a ruler of the people and the teacher of Israel. And Nicodemus, at this point in time, was on his way to hell. Amazing, isn't it? Astonishing to think of that. Why? Why? Because none of those things change the heart. None of those works have anything to do with God's grace and mercy in Jesus Christ to save a sinner. You can't be saved by any of those things. None of those give the regenerating renovation that man needs in the heart to savingly repent and savingly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Nicodemus here has a form of godliness But Nicodemus is denying the practical power of it. He needs a regenerating work of God's grace. Now this is made manifest in the conversation with Jesus Christ that follows. Verse 2. This man, Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus says, we know. We know who you are, Jesus. Now consider with me what Nicodemus knew. We've considered who Nicodemus was. Consider with me what Nicodemus knew. He knew that the Lord was a qualified and respectable teacher. Calls him rabbi. An address reserved for a respectable teacher. He knew that Jesus Christ was sent by God. He was a sent one by God. And he knew that Christ performed miracles in the power of God. However, even from verse 2, we can see that there's a glaring deficiency in what Nicodemus said he knew, isn't there? The Lord Jesus Christ is just a teacher. (laughs) He's not Lord and God. If Jesus Christ was Lord and God to Nicodemus, Nicodemus wouldn't have waited to sneak off and come to see him by night. He would have been sitting at his feet all day, every day, learning from Jesus Christ, who is Lord and God. Do you see? He didn't want to approach him in the daylight. 
he sought him under the cover of darkness. That's because Nicodemus feared his fellow Pharisees more than he feared the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not fear those who can simply destroy the body, but fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus to him is just a good teacher. He's an ordinary man. Shows that Nicodemus' understanding is also shrouded in darkness, isn't it? There are many, many, many who would profess far more than Nicodemus. I know that Jesus is the Savior. You're out witnessing. You run into people all the time. I know that Jesus Christ has saved me. How do you know? I know that I'm a Christian. Many will say, in order to be saved, all you have to do is admit that you're a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. Well, that's enough. But like Nicodemus, there's a deficiency in their knowledge. Knowledge alone will not save you. There's been no work of grace in their heart. They continue to live in their sin. They're not following the Lord in faith. They're not obeying the word of God. They take no interest in the word of God. They're not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. There's no heart wrenched hatred of sin, right? There's none of that in their experience, but I know Jesus Christ, and I know that he saved me, and I know these facts, and I know I'm a Christian. Well, Jesus, in verse three, answers him. Nicodemus said, we know. Jesus, verse three, answered and said to him, most assuredly, truly, truly, I, even I, say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you see how one answers the other, right? What you know, what you think you know, will not save you. Unless one is born again, he cannot see. The word means to perceive. He cannot perceive the kingdom of God. Now notice four things with me about the Lord's response in verse three. Four things. One, Notice that the new birth, regeneration, that's what the Lord is talking about with those words, born again. He's talking about regeneration. Notice that the new birth is absolutely essential. And it's essential determined by that one word, unless. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It means that the new birth is essential. Apart from being raised from spiritual death to spiritual life, you cannot see the kingdom. New birth is absolutely essential. Second, notice notice that the verb born is born. That's an aorist passive. We would call it a divine passive. It's passive in the sense that regeneration is something done to you, not something done by you. It's done in you by God. It's not done by you for God. This is because we are dead spiritually apart from new birth. We're dead in our sins and trespasses. You were completely passive in your first birth, right? You were passive in that. You really didn't do anything. Be honest with yourself. You didn't do anything but cause pain. (laughs) You were completely passive in your first birth. You won't have anything to do with your second birth either. My name is Mark. That's what you're going to call me. I'm going to be born today. I'm going to be born to Mike and Becky. Those are my parents. Here's the day on which I choose to be born. Make sure there are warm blankets and a lot of water available when I come. (laughs) You don't have anything to do with your first birth. You don't have anything to do with your second birth. We do not choose to be born. That is a (laughs) profound truth, isn't it? We do not choose to be born. The aorist, it's an aorist passive verb, right? The aorist, that's the tense. The aorist points to the fact that regeneration, one is instantaneous. It's like a snapshot. It happens in a moment. Regeneration, the new birth, is instantaneous. It's not like sanctification. It's not a process, It takes place over time, like the Roman Catholic Church teaches, or some Arminians teach, or some Pelagians teach. It's a single occurrence. It happens once, and it happens for good. You are born again. Literally there, in verse 3, it means born from above. (laughs) The word literally means from above. You are born from above, born from heaven, (laughs) 
Not a birth from earth. It's not a birth from earth. It's a birth from above. Third, notice that apart from being born again, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Clearly speaks of man's total inability that is the result of his total depravity. Doesn't mean that you're as bad as you can be. What it means is that as a result of the fall, every single faculty of man is corrupted. Every single faculty of man rendered hopeless apart from a work of God by his spirit. Your heart is depraved. Your will is depraved. Your mind is depraved. Your emotions are depraved. Your affections are depraved. Your imagination is depraved. Your, de your desires are depraved. Apart from a radical resurrection, you are un able to see, unable to perceive. You are spiritually blind. You are spiritually deaf. You are spiritually dead. You are spiritually unresponsive. You need new life. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the God, things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Why? He cannot know them. Why? Because they are spiritual spiritually discerned. A new birth, therefore, is absolutely necessary. Four, notice what's at stake. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Apart from being born again, you're in the kingdom of darkness. There are only, notice, there are only two kingdoms. The kingdom of light, the kingdom of the son of his love, and the kingdom of darkness. There is no in-between. There is no pipe dream purgatory, which is an absurd twisting of scripture. There are two kingdoms, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of darkness. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, that God must deliver us from the power of darkness and must convey us into the kingdom of the son of his love. This is heaven or hell. You must be born again. You must be born again. Well, in verse 4, Nicodemus responds to this statement by the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to what Nicodemus asks. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, Well, how can a man be born when he's old? <laughs> a sensible question, Nicodemus. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, the Lord tells Nicodemus that he must be born again, passive. You must be born again, passive. And the very first response of Nicodemus out of his flesh is, What must I do, active, to be saved? Do you see how Nicodemus responds? Well, what do I got to do? How can this happen? How can a man do this? Can he enter a, time, a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is speaking figuratively here, but the essence of his question is this. What do I have to do? How do I start all over again? Like the rich young ruler, all these things I've done for my youth, what is left for me to do? What does Jesus say? Verse 5. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, Nicodemus, you must try harder. <laughs> no. In verse 5, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, Nicodemus, you must do more. There's something left you haven't done. No, no, no. Children of God are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Nicodemus, you need a new heart. You need a new heart. You need a new nature. You need to be made a new creation. You need to be indwelt by my spirit. Jesus answers, you must be passive, completely remade. You need a miracle, a miracle to take place in you. Verse five, Jesus answered, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is not a natural work, Nicodemus. This is a supernatural work. You cannot attribute to man that which may only be done by God. Nicodemus's religion to this point is entirely centered around what Nicodemus does. As a Pharisee, he labors to keep the law, blameless under the law. Are we to obey God? Yes, not as a means of earning salvation. Nicodemus is entirely focused on what he must do. As if law keeping, as if by being a good Jew, he could go to heaven. In one moment and with one statement, Jesus Christ sweeps 
all of his religion <laughs> off the table and out the door and into the wastebasket. Everything that Nicodemus thinks that he knows and thinks that he should do and be in order to earn favor with God, it's all in one statement just wiped off the map. Do you see? Jesus emphatically states, it is by the work of God alone. It is in the power of God alone. You and I must be radically changed at the level of our heart, at the level of our nature. And what's the first thing that many do with the Lord's teaching here in verse five? What's the very first thing that many do? Well, obviously, verse five, we need to be baptized then. <laughs> You know, it says there in verse 5, unless you're born of water and the Spirit. They just forget the teaching that comes before. They forget the teaching that comes after. Well, obviously then it's by baptism. So then what must I do to be saved? I've got to be baptized. <laughs> to which we reply, Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, <laughs> but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of the waters of baptism. No. What does Paul say to Titus? Through the washing of regeneration. That's what it means to be born of water and the Spirit. Water in the Old Testament was a symbol. Again, these are physical things pointing to spiritual things. Physical washing in water. Even baptism is a picture, is it not? Physical washing of water pointing to spiritual washing, spiritual cleansing that we need as sinners. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Water is a symbol a reference to the cleansing work of the Holy Spirit that begins at the new birth. This is a spiritual washing. This is a spiritual pur purification. It's a forgiveness of sins. It's the cleansing of our conscience seen over and over and over and over again in the Old Testament. We're talking about spiritual realities, not physical realities. No work of righteousness Paul says, no work of righteousness, no physical water can cleanse the sin-stained heart of man. There is no cleanser powerful enough save one, and that's the blood of the Lamb. <laughs> the Spirit of God applies the work of Christ to the elect of God. He does so beginning with the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. You must be born again. Why? Why? Verse 6. Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Like produces like. Kind produces kind. So sinners produce sinners. <laughs> a Christian, well, that's a new creation. <laughs> a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, well, that's something new. A genuine disciple can only be produced by the Spirit of God. You must be born again. Verse 7, do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. Don't stand there in amazement. This is clearly taught in the Scriptures. For Nicodemus, this was all over his Old Testament Scriptures. This is exactly what Moses was speaking about in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Don't stand there astonished at what I'm saying to you, Nicodemus. You should know this. This is clearly taught in your Bible. Verse 8, the wind, Numa. The wind, Numa, blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Numa, the spirit. Wind, verse 8, compared to, a metaphor for, the spirit of God. Wind in verse 8 is a reference to the spirit. Numa, breath, wind, spirit. Consider a few observations with me on the analogy that the Lord makes here. Verse 1, or 1, the first observation. In verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes. The Spirit blows where he wishes. The wind isn't controlled by human beings. 
the wind isn't beholden as if he is subject to respond to human actions, human works, or human effort. The wind doesn't sit back and wait on human beings to do what human beings do so that the wind can then do what he does. The wind blows where he wishes to. The wind can't be comprehended. You can't see its point of origin You can't see its ultimate destination. We don't know where it comes from or where it's going in terms of his work. Modern meteorology notwithstanding. (laughs) The wind isn't beholden to human knowledge or human understanding. Third, the wind's effects are clear and undeniable. You can hear the sound. You can see the rustling of the trees. You can see the bramble rolling across the parking lot. You can witness its unmistakable power. Verse 8, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. We don't know how the Spirit does that miraculous, glorious work. We can't comprehend those things. It is awesome power. It's a work of the Spirit of God by which he renovates the entire nature, the heart of man, And it's something that we don't fully understand, but we see the fruits of it. We see the effects of it. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The new birth of God's covenant people has its source, its origin, in the unseen, incomprehensible, powerful, fruit-producing Spirit of God. He is the one who moves where he wishes to bring about life in dead sinners. It's not the product of human will. Not the product of human running, not the product of human knowledge, not the product of human effort. You must be born again. It's through his work in the heart of God's people that the Spirit of God then produces fruits of the Spirit. We see his effects. We see the fruits of his working. Regeneration is supernatural. It's a work of God alone. It's a work of his divine power. Regeneration is instantaneous. It's a one-time work. It's the implanting of spiritual life in those who are spiritually dead. Regeneration is radical. It is a transformation, a renovation of the whole person. The mind, the will, the emotions, the affections, the actions, the desires. And through regeneration, it is through regeneration that a sinner will come to Christ. That response of repentance and faith is only part, is only possible in the heart of one who is dead in sins and trespasses. It's only possible by a regenerating work of God's spirit to change the heart, to enable the sinner, to empower the sinner to respond with God-glorifying, God-pleasing Repentance and faith. It's the only way that's possible. It's like raising Lazarus from the tomb. (laughs) The Lord Jesus Christ stands in front of that tomb. Tells them to roll away the the stone. Mary comes up to him and says, Lord, I don't think you want to do that. He's been in there four days. He stinketh. (laughs) Lord says, roll it away. And he stands outside the tomb. Lazarus is dead inside. And the Lord Jesus Christ in divine power calls forth Lazarus from death to life. As glorious as that miracle is, the miracle of regeneration far more. Calling a dead sinner, changing all that they are to now being able to respond with love and affection, and devotion, and hatred for sin, and a hungering, and a thirsting for righteousness, and a love for the Word of God that simply wasn't there before. A sight of the Lord Jesus Christ as unspeakably precious, where before He wasn't, where before at most you were indifferent toward Him, now... (laughs) He is gloriously beautiful to behold and precious to you. And your heart on this side of eternity, wrapped up now 
in loving him, worshiping him, waiting earnestly for his appearing, that you might spend eternity with him, praising him. That change of heart just simply is not the fruit of any decision of man. The question that we have to ask in conclusion is this. Have you been born again? Have you been born again? Like I said, with some, that work of God by his spirit in the heart of a sinner is maybe virtually imperceptible at times. But many have thought to themselves, given time, you know, everything seems to have changed. You look back over the last six months, the last year, the last two years, the last three years, whatever it's been, you know, and you think to yourself, I have a love for God's word that simply wasn't there before. I have a love for the people of God that simply was not there before. I desire to obey him. And with God's help, I'm laboring to obey him. I'm overcoming sin when I couldn't overcome before. I just, these changes, these fruits must be fruits of God's grace by his spirit at work in my heart. And I believe I've been born again, praise God, right? You see the effects of his work where the wind blows. Has the spirit of God done a work in your heart? For others, the work is, you recognize it. It's seemingly one day to the next, and now everything has changed. The way I see the world has changed. The way I see my sin has changed. The way I see the Lord Jesus Christ has changed. The way I see the church has changed. The way I see everything has been transformed. It's like a veil, a brick wall has been torn down from in front of my eyes. I see the Bible like I've never seen the Bible before. Right? I see my sin like I've never seen my sin before. And everything changes. Do you see in your life the fruits of the Spirit's work? Do you see the effects of the breath of God blowing through your once dead, dry heart? Do you see it? Can you say, praise God, by His Spirit I see fruit. Amen. Praise the Lord. Cry out to God for more. <laughs> if not this morning, if you say to yourself, my religion has been a sham. My professed Christian life is superficial. If you could work past my outward profession, my moral exterior, you would see a heart that is cold, dead, or indifferent toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I simply don't see life within me. Then flee, flee to Christ. Flee to God to do a work in your heart. Spirit of God, please God, breathe life into my dead heart. I can't cause me to live. Please God, circumcise the foreskin of my heart. Please God, cut me. Pierce me with the two-edged sword of your word. Apply the all-sufficient work of the Savior and save my soul. Please, God, do that work in me that only you can do. And don't stop crying out to God for it until he does that work in you. The Lord is gracious. He is rich in mercy and abounding in grace. And may the wind of your spirit, God, Blast forth in power upon our heart. May he give you life from the dead. All praise and honor and glory to the one who raises the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Take just a few moments and go before the Lord silently now. And ask the Lord to work in you this morning according to his good will and pleasure. And we'll pray together and you'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we need you. The work that is done in us by your spirit is simply a work that we are entirely and utterly incapable of. That work in the heart of the sinner to give them 
spiritual life in Christ and that work in the hearts of your saints to sanctify. We need uh, the work of your spirit more desperately. And so we ask you, for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ, whose bride we are, please, Lord, wash us with the water by the word. Conform us into his image. Make us a chaste bride, holy and without spot or blemish or any such thing. And for his glory, make us a fitting bride. We love you. We thank you for this work done by your spirit. I pray, Lord, convert sinners for your glory and cause them to be born again. Build up my brothers and sisters. Um, Cause us, Lord, to rejoice in that work and to depend on you in prayer for that work and to avail ourselves of the means of grace for that work to take place within our hearts that we might be conformed to his image for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.